World's strongest assassin falls in love with the girl he is sent to kill and becomes her teacher instead. Kufa Vampir is a master assassin who lives in a world that is as dark and desolate as my love life. While the majority of Earth is shrouded in darkness and inhabited by monsters called Lankanthropes, the last human settlement is a giant Campbell stand like structure that houses various city blocks encased in super tough gorilla glass. In this world, some rare people have a supernatural ability called mana that gives them the power to fight against Lankanthropes by joining various guilds. Our MC, Kufa Vampir, is an assassin of the guild White Knight who does not hesitate to do the dirtiest of things. On one of his missions, he is ambushed by another guild and enemy assassins surround him. They shoot at him, but Kufa is faster than the Flash and cuts all the bullets, followed by all the assassins. In front of his overwhelming speed and skill, the enemies have no chance to fight back, but their leader survives the onslaught. Their leader, let's call them the Mummy, clashes with Kufa, but then our hero's senior comes and interrupts their battle. The Mummy throws the sofa at Kufa and runs away, and the senior tells Kufa to stop because it is not worth pursuing him. They find that their target for this mission was already dead. This mission concerned a teen girl named Melita Angel who belongs to the Angel family, one of the three top noble families in this world. Her grandpa had hired Kufa to find out if Melita was really his biological granddaughter or if her mother had seen another man. Since they have no DNA tests in this world, Kufa was supposed to interrogate the target suspected to be the other man, but now his senior tells him that he will have to infiltrate the girl's life and find out about her origins himself. He takes a train that takes him from a lower city block to a higher one. He leaves the train at the same time as a cheerful woman, and uses his gentlemanly raise by helping her carry her things till they part ways. He reaches his destination, which is a posh school for noble girls, and he meets his target, Melita Angel, there. She was too excited to meet Kufa, who was coming in as her private tutor, but as she notices him, she trips, and he catches her, accumulating risk points. He sets her down and greets her, saying that he will be her personal tutor for the next three years. Just then, the academy bells ring and Melita has to go to her class, but she is not pleased to learn that Kufa will accompany her as her attendant and bodyguard. They go to the school which is filled with girls as flat as surfboards, and with BMI less than 15. The girls are practicing their combat skills and a bully named Nerva taunts Melita, remarking that she was a useless girl, with no mana who didn't need a tutor, but a rebirth. Melita flinches on hearing this and Nerva asks her to join her for practice. As the two girls deal with each other, Kufa breaks the fourth wall and explains that mana was the ability that gave unusual talents and supernatural abilities to some rare people, who were given the title of nobles. These abilities generally awaken around seven years of age, but Melita was thirteen but without mana, despite being the child of one of the three top noble houses. Kufa is impressed by the way Melita faces Nerva and her overall sword handling techniques, but she has no mana and thus gets her ass whooped by the bully. Nerva mocks Melita after defeating her and compares her to her cousin Elise Angel, who was from a branch family, but she had awakened the highly coveted paladin in class and had a tutor from the most reputed guild Crest Legion. Melita is hurt upon hearing this and runs away, with her cousin Eli chasing after her. At night, Kufa writes his report that states that Melita is not the Angel family's biological child, and at this point, his hidden mission starts. Now he has to assassinate the girl on her grandpa's orders. Even though it was not wise to do it so soon, Kufa cannot let the girl suffer any more humiliation because he was touched by her hard work and wants to show her some mercy. However, when he goes to her room to do the deed, she is not there. Kufa searches for her all over the city and finds her in a park fighting three Halloween-themed Lancanthropes. Kufa realizes that the monsters were brought here by Melita's grandpa, who often tried to stimulate her mana through real-life danger, but it clearly doesn't work. Melita fights the clowns with all her might, but her sword breaks and the monsters humiliate her by gaining up on her. Kufa wonders why she is not crying for help and Melita speaks up only when the monsters try to cut her blonde hair that reminds her of her mother, who was treated badly by her family, so she left on a milk run. Melita wants to be acknowledged as the child of the Angel family, and if she calls someone for help, no one will acknowledge her. Kufa feels is a cruel joke of fate and cannot tolerate it any longer. He suddenly cuts up and burns one of the monsters just by looking at it. He then charges at another clown monster and ends it in the same way, while the other one runs away and Kufa uses his special move, Phantom Blade, to destroy it. He offers his hand to Melita, but she is still too proud for someone who was just humbled by a bunch of clowns and gets up on her own. Kufa suddenly feels bad for the girl, who has always been alone, and he wants her to win against the world. As the girl cries, he tells her about a risky way that can awaken her mana, but if it fails, she will die. Melita accepts the chance with zero hesitation. Kufa drinks a potion and feeds it to her mouth-to-mouth, which is also your cue to call the FBI. 
Melida is overwhelmed by the sensation and feels that she is drowning while her body is being ripped apart, but then she sees a light on the surface and reaches out to it. With that, she has successfully attained her mana, and shows off her Super Saiyan form to her maids later, while Kufa watches them from a corner like an emo boy because what he did was against the code of his guild. Now he must hide the truth about his identity as an assassin from the girl and the secret behind her power from his client and superiors, because if anyone finds out the truth, it will be instant game over for the two of them. Later that night, Kufa checks Melita's body for any physical abnormalities from the potion he fed her to awaken her mana. She wants to call the FBI, but he says that it is very important to do this checkup to ensure that he has not harmed his client, even unintentionally. His maxed out Riz works wonders and Melita gives him a free pass to her body. Kufa explains to her that she did not get the Paladin class, but the Samurai class, just like him since he shared his mana with her. He then tells her that even with the subpar class, she can still prove herself worthy of the Angel family's name by having a good track record. There are no problems with her body and Melita is happy that now she can be like everyone else. However, Kufa forbids her to use mana apart from his training for one week and she is as disappointed in him as my parents are in me. In one week, a ranking tournament is going to take place in the academy, and everyone is excited about it. Nerva's lackeys hype her up as the favorite from their class, and she takes this chance to tease Melita. She calls herself a friend and steals her book, and poor Melita can't even say anything to her. Kufa is outside, and he hears all the girls mocking his lady and feels bad for her. Later, Melita complains that she still has to be mocked even after awakening her power, and Kufa replies that her power is still imperfect, so she needs to keep working in silence to make her big debut at the tournament. Suddenly, he notices someone stalking them and calls them out to find that the stalkers are Melita's cousin Eli and the pink-haired girl Kufa met on the train. The girl introduces herself as Rosetti Prickett, Ella's private tutor. Melian is surprised to hear that name because Rosetti was a well-known celebrity who came from a commoner background but she joined Crest Legion Guild and was granted the title of nobility. She acts shy on hearing all this praise and asks Kufa to call her Rose, saying that they should go out for drinks sometimes. However, Kufa is no simp and slaps her hand away, saying he has no time for a vile woman like her who will be a bad influence on his lady. Rose is furious and teases Kufa that her student will beat his student in the tournament before running away. A week later, the day of the tournament arrives and Melita is nervous and wants to run, while Kufa tries to raise her morale. Suddenly, a carriage passes them by and Melita notices her father in it, but she cannot dare to approach him. Her condition worsens with each passing moment, and then Nerva and the rest of her gang arrive to tease Melita, saying that the party that chose her is unlucky, just like her family. Seeing Melita's mental health declining, Kufa interferes and politely tells Nerva that his ears will start to bleed if she talks for a bit more and tells her to shut the fuck up. She is triggered and starts insulting him, calling him the useless teacher of a malice student. This angers Melita, who slaps Nerva's hand away and tells her to keep her teacher's name out of her mouth while swearing to destroy her in the tournament. Soon the tournament is about to start, and the two leading men of the Angel family, Melita's father Felvis and grandfather Mordru, have taken their seats. Mordru looks at Kufa, who knows that this is the moment his performance as a teacher will be evaluated. Meanwhile, in the arena, Melita's teammates tell her to leave everything to them, but she asks them to let her fight too. A few moments later, the school principal announces the start of the battle, and girls from both teams use mana and rush at each other. Melita takes a deep breath and charges towards Nerva without activating her mana. Nerva rushes at her too, hoping to obliterate and humiliate her in front of everyone. She activates her mana as she jumps for an attack, but Melita activates her mana at the last moment and counterattacks, knocking her back. Nerva is in disbelief and so is everyone else because they never thought Melita could use mana. Nerva is furious and declares that nothing changes even if Melita can use mana now. She attacks her and Melita feints a sword attack, but hits her with a kick. Nerva gets even more reckless and Melita uses this chance to blind her with sand and then send her crashing into a wall. Nerva removes her limiter to use her full strength as she jumps up to deliver her finishing move on Melita. She comes down like a meteorite and breaks the arena with her powerful attack. As the dust from the collision fades, Melita is found sitting silently, and Nerva believes she won. She approaches her and says that she will spare her from further humiliation if she surrenders now because they are friends. When Melita gives no answer, Nerva prepares to finish her, but that Melita points her sword at her neck, telling her that Kufa's attacks are more frightening. As both the girls release their mana, a storm rises and despite being injured, Melita pushes Nerva against a wall. However, just as she delivers her finishing blow, she runs out of her mana and loses her sword. Both Melita and Kufa panic, and she runs away. Nerva takes this chance and launches consecutive blows at the running Melita from behind while insulting her. 
Melita falls to the ground and Nerva asks her to give up, but she refuses to do so and Nerva tears up because of her rage. She's a bit cracked in the head and keeps thinking that bullying Melita is the same as being her friend and she cannot bear to see her grow stronger. Nerva promises to put her on a wheelchair for the rest of her life, but Melita was hiding a secret weapon too. She awakens her mana once more and uses the Phantom Blade technique to knock Nerva out of the park. Hufat is stunned to see this and realizes that Melita learned this move by copying him and secretly practicing it after their regular sessions. Melita then borrows Nerva's weapon and rushes ahead to destroy her team's checkpoint. Nerva's teammates attack Melita, but her team backs her up and she destroys their checkpoint to win the battle. Later, she runs to Kufa, hoping to get a head pack for her great performance, but he lifts her up and claims that she was even better than his expectations. Just then, her dad walks past her without even glancing in her direction. Melita calls out to him and says that she won the battle, but he tells her not to get carried away because it was just a school match and she should try to prove her strength in the inter-school ranked tournament. Melita starts crying upon hearing his response, but Kufa tells her to look at the bright side of things. She gained the courage to talk to her dad, and even though it was not favorable, he gave her a response. Kufa says that this is a big step forward, and Melita believes him. Just then, Nerva comes running to them, and while Melita is scared, the bully girl is there only to return her book. Apparently, Nerva's heart changed faster than I changed tabs when my parents enter my room, and she apologizes to Melita meekly before running away. Soon, Melita and her group have their second match and this time their opponent is Eli, who single-handedly clutches the game with her paladin class, astonishing everyone. A few days later, Melita shows off her dress for a carnival to Kufa, who gives a rather plain reaction, claiming that he does not like festivals because he grew up in the land of eternal darkness, where they have no festivals. Melita feels bad for him and requests that he dance with her around the campfire on the first day of the festival. Kufa replies that he has another mission that day and promises to return by the last day to keep her heart. The festival comes soon enough and all the girls are in their uniforms, but Ellis attracts everyone's attention because her maid ordered a special uniform for her to flex her status. While some people admire how gorgeous she looks, others say that she is too entitled and can't even wear the school uniform like normal students. Eli feels bad and runs away so Maliga chases her and finds her crying at the fountain because she also wanted to wear the same dress as her friends, but her maid did not let her. Melita tries to comfort her when suddenly the lights go out and some hooded men surround them, led by the mummy. The mummy kidnaps them and Melita wakes up in a strange place. She tries to activate her mana, but finds that the strange bandages around her wrist are sealing her power. She then turns to the mummy, sensing that he was a lancanthrope, and asks him why he was in the human zone. The mummy begins oversharing his personal information like me at two in the night. He declares that he is an artificial lancanthrope who was created by genetic modification and works for an organization called Yield Grimfis, among other inconsequential things. Melita asks him why he kidnapped her, and he commands his hallowing scarecrow soldiers to drag out Eli. The mummy explains that he plans to forcibly transplant Eli's paladin class into Melita's body. The procedure has a low success rate, and even if it succeeds, the girls may still lose their lives. Melita is terrified and backs away, only to find that they are in an isolated museum that is surrounded by the mummy's guild, so no help can arrive. Just then, Eli wakes up and starts screaming at seeing the monsters, as she has a phobia of clowns and scarecrows ever since they were kids. Melita used to comfort her whenever she got scared and realizes she has to protect her little sister again now. She breaks a dino leg with a hammer so that it falls on the monsters, giving her the chance to run away with Eli. They find the building plan and Melita decides to use the emergency exit as she keeps on boosting Ellie's morale. Since they cannot use their mana, and they have no divine attribute weapons to face the monsters either, Melita has to think of something else. She recalls that Ellie's dress was made of divine nature material and rips it off to create a torch that she plans to ignite using the flint stone on her tiara. Before she can do anything, the monsters catch them and slap her. Eli is caught, and to save her, Melita smashes the tire on the floor, creating flames from the jewel and setting the torch on fire. With her makeshift divine weapon, she scares the lancanthropes and burns one of them by making it deep throat the torch while poking the other's eyeball. After freeing Eli, she runs to the emergency exit, but the mummy is already there. Melita attacks him, but the mummy outclasses her and catches the torch with his bare hands, extinguishing it. He then kicks Melita away and slaps Eli as she tries to help. Melita is still trying to create a fire as the mummy approaches her. He's about to hurt her when Melita and Eli stare at him, and their combined power sends shivers down his spines. He deems them a great potential threat and decides to dispose of them right away. He's about to kill Melita, but just then, the door bursts open and Kufa and Rose come to the rescue. They cover the girls and then rush ahead, mowing down the enemies. Kufa cuts them with his sword, 
while Rose does some acrobatics like she is on America's Got Talent before sprouting wings made of mana and defeating all the enemies. By that time, Kufa has dealt with the rest of the enemies and he asks Rose to look after the girls as he chases the main culprit. He finds the mummy, who claims that since Kufa failed the job to kill Melita, it was given to his guild. Kufa realizes that Melita's grandpa is behind it. The mummy then breaks out something like Davy Jones' heart from a container and injects it with a concentrated mana potion. The small sphere turns into a giant dinosaur with purple flames surrounding its body and terrible breath. Kufa is stunned to see it, and the mummy claims that this is an artificial lankanthrope with maxed out stats. The monster attacks Kufa, who dodges but finds mummy on the other side. The mummy launches consecutive attacks on him with his bandages, but Kufa fends them off before overwhelming the enemy with his speed. He kicks the mummy and then uses his ultimate move to severely injure him and send him crashing to the floor. The mummy soon gets a chance to counterattack when Kufa is distracted by the monster. He grabs Kufa's hand with bandages and seals his mana, so he has no choice but to cut off his hand to keep fighting. The mummy is astonished, but then he asks Kufa if the girl is worth sacrificing his arm for. He replies that in a few years, she will turn into a splendid adult who will surpass him and become the strongest warrior in this land, until then he will protect her at all costs. The mummy orders the beast to finish Kufa, and it swallows him whole. However, just as the mummy turns away, he feels a powerful shockwave and turns back to see Kufa manhandling the monster. He unleashes his true potential and uses his mana to crush and crumple the monster until it implodes. The mummy is terrified of his power, and then Kufa shows him what else he is hiding. His hair turns white, and a blue fire aura covers him as he shows his full power. Kufa picks up his torn hand and reattaches it to his arm seamlessly. The mummy is terrified, and just by the aura, he knows that Kufa is a vampire, the strongest kind of lancanthrope. He steps back as he asks him what he was doing here, and Kufa pins him against a wall as he claims to be a half lancanthrope just like him. The mummy is shitting his pants, but Kufa tells him he will not die today. He declares that the power Melita used earlier to intimidate him was similar to a paladin's abilities, which means she is the legitimate daughter of the angel family. Kufa asks the mummy to relay his message to his client, telling him not to even think about hurting Melita the next time. With that, he leaves the mummy on the ground and returns to Melita's side. He claims that her dad was the one who relayed the information about her kidnapping so that he could save her in time. Melita is overjoyed on hearing this and Kufa takes this chance to ask her for a dance just like he had promised. Melita happily offers him her hand and then asks him how long he will be her teacher because she wants him to stay by her side until she's 18. Kufa kneels in front of her, promising her that he will stay by her side as long as she needs him, and then they start dancing. Soon the classes resume and Ela clings to Melita as they have gotten together again. Their tutors are behind them and Rose is also clinging to Kufa, who is not a simp and shrugs her away. He tells her that they are supposed to be rivals and their clients will not be happy to see them like this, especially Ely's headmaid, who is following them like a curse. They are all going to the glass castle, where an inter-school competition will be held. As everyone is gathered in the assembly, Melita requests that Ely accept her into her team, but Ely hesitates and by the time she comes up with an answer, the assembly starts. The principal declares the beginning of the Luna Selection Tournament, where the top two students from the two sister schools will compete for the title of Luna, the Moon Maiden. The rest of the students will have their regular classes in the meantime, and the four candidates will get the chance to train until the real trial starts on the last day of the week. Soon the girls from school B arrive, and after their candidates introduce themselves, the principals remove the cloth from the glass monument to reveal the names of their candidates. Everyone is shocked when they see Melita and Eli being named as the two candidates, but the principal still announces their names. The girls overcome their shock as they stand in front of the assembly, and the principal asks them to choose their teams for the tournament. Melita looks at the unfriendly faces in front of her and loses hope, but Minerva volunteers to join her team along with Krista, a third-year student who was supposed to be the real candidate. After everyone has chosen their team, the principal announces the beginning of the tournament and isolates the campus from the external world using a barrier. Later, everyone gossips that Melita must have used some trick to get her name on the monument, and she cries as she explains to Kufa that she is innocent. He hugs and comforts her, promising that even if the world is against her, he will believe her. Soon, Melita and her teammates start practicing under Kufa's guidance, and as she takes a break, she thinks about how Eli is far more powerful than her. Just then, one girl from school B comes to greet her and says that she has heard a lot of the two angel sisters. She motivates Melita to defeat Eli so that she can prove worthy of the head branch of the angel family. With that, she vanishes in the wind and Kufa comes just after that. He is suspicious about a conspiracy and finds Eli's maid tiptoeing around the campus at night. She gets nervous when Kufa finds her and acts like he is taking out a shard of stained glass from her dress. 
The maid panics, saying that she was careful to leave no traces. Kufa says she has been busted and calls out Melita and others to inform them that the maid put their names in the Goblet of Fire, I mean in the Glass Monument. The maid is shameless and declares that she did that only to pit the angel girls against each other, so that Eli humiliates Melita and proves that she is much better than her. Melita stands up for herself and talks the same old crap about bonds and feelings before promising the maid that she will prove that she is not inferior to Eli in the tournament. Later, as Kufa leaves Melita's room after tucking her in the bed, he notices something fall behind him and turns around to see a black letter origami, which meant it was a letter from his guild, White Knight. Kufa visits the forest and meets another of the guild's powerhouses, Black Media, who talks only using burner letters. She tells Kufa that the boss feels his report the last time was incomplete and wants to know what he's hiding about Melita. Media threatens to kill Melita if she finds anything and Kufa attacks her while saying that he won't let anything happen to his student. He keeps on attacking Media, who easily dodges his attacks, and then draws her sword as she tells him that this is betrayal and she will finish him first. Kufa replies that he serves Melita right now and he will protect her from everyone. Both of them release their mana and attack each other, with Media using Call of Duty-style slurs to distract Kufa. However, she is in for a surprise as Rose attacks her. She came here hearing the sound of battle, found Kufa fighting a suspicious stranger, and decided to help him. She throws her discs at Media, who blocks them and then shoots her with a Glock. Her aim is worse than a stormtrooper and she misses, but then draws a third weapon. Rose is shocked at how much stuff she can pull out of her ass, but then Media declares that she will finish them now. Just then, a crowd comes following the sound of commotion, and since Media has a serious condition called being an introvert, she vanishes before being found, but only after warning Kufa that she will always be behind him like a shadow. Rose asks him who the hell was the girl, and he replies that she is the strongest clown who can imitate the abilities of all seven basic mana classes. On the other side, Eli visits Melita and tells her that she plans to lose to her on purpose so that everyone acknowledges her. She doesn't care how it happens, but she wants to stay with her sister, who is not her equal in any way, and this hurts Melita. Meanwhile, Kufa and Rose inform the principal about Black Media and ask her to suspend the tournament. She replies that Dumbledore didn't suspend the True Wizard tournament even though Voldemort was near, so she won't do anything either. The next day, Rose spots Eli eating breakfast alone and asks Eli if something happened between them. Eli says nothing, but the maid bitches about how Melita is inferior to Eli. However, Melita has some other friends like that Sundir Nerva, who sits next to her, claiming that it was only because the seat was empty. Krista also joins them, and she teases the girls and makes the mood cheerful. The days pass with the girls studying, training, and bonding with each other. The night before the trial, Kufa enters Melita's room with milk to give her strength, and she says that teacher's milk is very tasty. Kufa then asks her if anything happened between Eli and her, and Melita tells him the truth about how her sister wants to lose on purpose. She explains that ever since they were kids, Eli was fond of her and always looked up to her, but now Melita fears that she was not the correct role model for her. Kufa tells her to stop thinking about this and advises her to talk about her feelings with Eli the next time they meet. The next day, the trial is about to begin, and the principal explains that it will be a battle royale between the four candidates and their teams, and they have to steal their opponent's pins to win. The map for the battle is the entire campus, and the spectators have been given magical binoculars to see the match from anywhere. All four teams take positions, but Kufa leaves after wishing his student the best of lucks, since he plans to deal with Black Media using this chance. Melita and her team walk forward and face the Glass Guardians, who allow them to enter the Glass Castle only after they display their mana. They enter the Assembly Hall, where a sniper from Ellie's team shoots a warning shot at them. Another one of Ellie's teammates attacks them from behind, and Nerva blocks her. Ila comes forward too, and Krista and Merva tell Melita to fight her while they deal with her teammates, Melita follows Eli, and they arrive at the central hallway, where they activate their gold and silver manas before clashing with each other. Melita asks Eli to reveal what she really feels about her, and she pushes her away as she claims that Melita is the weaker one of them. Eli says she always ran away from fighting her because she did not want to know how weak her sister was. She attacks Melita, who dodges, and then Eli declares that she is fine with being a sub, as she always wants to stay below her sister. Melita is relieved to hear this, and just as Eli is going to finish her, she blocks her attack and promises to dominate her completely on the battlefield. Both the girls prepare for their ultimate attack, and Eli claims that Melita cannot win in a hundred years, but then suddenly, Melita cuts through her sword and tells her to repeat what she just said. Eli is shivering, and Melita turns her into a punching bag and pins her to the ground, saying that she will be the stronger older sister no matter what. She starts crying as she asks Eli to rely on her, and the two girls have an emotional patch-up. 
Just then, Nerva arrives there and comments that it will be a shame if someone ruins their nice moment. On the other hand, Kufan has found the girl who paid Melita a visit earlier, and he suspects that she is Media in disguise. He asks her to hand him the proof she has collected about Melita in the bag, and the girl refuses. Kufa cuts the bag and pins her to the wall, but jokes on him because the girl is into being dominated. She tells him to do whatever he pleases with her, but he is no simp and attacks her. The girl blocks his attack with her sword and her dark mana, and Kufa immediately steps back. He realizes that the girl has the power to absorb enemy mana, and Media cannot imitate such high-level classes. He kneels before the girl and requests to know her name. The girl introduces herself as Mew, the daughter of one of the big three noble families and the wielder of the Diabolos class. Kufa apologizes to Mew and then runs away. She is sad that he did not have his way with her, but then expresses relief because her items are still safe. Kufa rushes back to the glass castle, realizing that he made a mistake from the start and Media must be near Melita right now. That is true, because Media had been disguising herself as Nerva, and Melita realizes this when she notices that her mana is different. Media transforms into her real self and uses her power to create a giant explosion that sends the glass palace crumbling. Melita and Eli run away, but Media attacks them from behind. Melita is determined to protect Eli as she faces Media, who is much more powerful than her and pushes her into a corner. She can't be bothered with typing anymore and speaks to the girls as she tells them goodbye. Luckily, the glass guardians label her as an intruder and stop her from attacking. She breaks their swords and jumps to finish the girls, but Kufa arrives like a hero and saves them. Rose also arrives shortly after him, but he does not need her help as he pushes Media outside and disarms her. He cuts through her robe to find out that she is a tomboy with stunted height. Media is embarrassed over her defeat and says she cannot return to the guild like this, but Kufa is generous and gives her a supplementary report to give to the boss to make his judgment. Later, Schoolby's leader is crowned Luna, and Nerva is found unconscious in the forest. The incident with Media is swept under the rub, but Kufa has doubts about the headmaid, who cannot use Mana and hence couldn't enter the glass castle, so who helped her change the names. Meanwhile, Mew and one of the cadets of School B, Sarah, are talking about the tournament. Mew boasts that she has a mana analyzer in her bag that has collected data about all girls here, and she wants to analyze Melita's mana and gift it to Sarah's elder brother, the leader of the Shixel Duke family, so that he will pay attention to her. Later, Melita tells Eli that she is creating a new unit, where she will be the leader and invites her to it. Eli happily accepts the invitation and the two sisters hug. On the other hand, Media is sent back to the academy by her boss who told her to go become an instructor there to keep an eye on Melita and Kufa from the inside, and she is not happy about it. One day, Melita wakes up from her sleep and sees her teacher holding his wooden sword over her face. She greets him and he compliments her, saying that she is becoming more aware of her surroundings even in her sleep. She is not happy that he was trying to train here even when she slept, but he asks her to get ready as it is the start of her school trip. Later, as they head out, Melita keeps on scolding her teacher, saying that he has no consideration for her personal space when suddenly Kufa's superior passes him by and hands him a medicine vial, asking him to use it carefully. He is taken aback, but then Eli and Rose also catch up to them, and Rose fidgets as she asks Kufa to marry her. The girls are surprised by how desperate she is, but she tells them the story about how her father has picked a man for her, and she has declined him by using the excuse of having a lover. Kufa is the only candidate for the role of her fake boyfriend, and he agrees to help her, much to Melita's displeasure, who feels she is getting cucked. As they walk to the school, Rose clings tightly to Kufa, calling him all sorts of adorable nicknames that make Melita so jealous that she clings to him too. Just then, the school director arrives there and lashes out at their indecent display in front of the whole school. She insults Melita and Rose and then greets Eli politely, saying she is completely opposite of her cousin. Melita replies, Okay, boomer, when suddenly, a carriage stops in front of them and a flamboyant man steps out of it. The man is Blossom Rose's adoptive dad, who always embarrasses her because of his delusional behavior. They go inside the academy, where Rose and Kufa tell the girls that the city block they are visiting is Blossom's territory and he is a renowned expert on genetic engineering. Blossom then turns to Rose and says that during this trip, he plans to hold her wedding ceremony, and she replies that she does not plan to marry anyone as she introduces Kufa as her boyfriend. Blossom is about to bring out his shotgun, but something about Kufa scares him, and he believes that he has seen his face before. He calms himself and apologizes to Kufa, saying he mistook him for someone who is dead now. He talks about a mass murder a few years ago in their city, whose main culprit was a 12-year-old boy whose face was exactly like Kufa's. Everyone is scared of the story, but the principal says that they are getting late and tells them to hurry ahead. As everyone else follows the principal, Kufa tells Melita that he will not join the assembly since he is not feeling well. 
She asks him if he was bothered by what Blossom and the director said, but he replies that he only cares about what she thinks about him. He leaves for his room and Melita cannot stop thinking that there is something odd going on right now. She can't focus on the assembly and runs away to talk to him. But then she passes by Media, who is now acting as a teacher at the academy under a fake identity. She stops Melita and tells her to return to the assembly. But as she gets close, Melita sees a horrible flashback where a man curses the infernal blue fire ice king. Melita is surprised that the teacher did not hear the voices she did, and then suddenly they hear a scream coming from the assembly. They rush there to find a girl who collapsed for no apparent reason and Kufa also arrives there soon. Blossom takes charge of the scene and presents his latest invention to the students. He takes out a test tube containing a potion that can react to the slightest trace of mana and finds the culprit behind the incident. Blossom pours the potion over the fire and it spreads out over the assembly as mist and then returns to turn the fire into a blue color. Blossom analyzes the blue fire and declares that the culprit is a man in his early 20s and everyone immediately suspects Kufa, who declares that he has no way to prove his innocence right now. The school trip still continues and Kufa is allowed to come with them. Melita is worried about him, she is certain that her teacher was not involved in the accident that happened just now. The train passes through a dark region with a permanent aurora and intermittent thunder, and Blossom tells the scared girls that this is his region's specialty. The train soon reaches the underground town of Shangarda, which is full of all kinds of vegetation thanks to Blossom's diligent research. As Blossom explains the plants to the girls, Melita keeps on staring at Kufa. Suddenly, she hears the man's voice again and wonders what's happening. She looks around and finds a boulder, which seems to be the source of the voice. However, Kufa stops her right before she touches the boulder and reminds her to take her schizophrenia meds. Blossom also tells them to get back because they were standing at a mystery spot that does not fit any logic. So far, he has found out that it is because of a strong magnetic field that the spot produces an unexplained phenomenon, but nothing else is known. Just then, a man comes running to Blossom and tells him that someone has gotten ill in the city again. They reach the city square where they find a man who has come down with a disease that turns anyone into a mindless killing machine. Blossom declares that the man cannot be saved and orders the soldiers to kill him immediately. The girls are shocked to see their first execution, and even the principal comes to reprimand Blossom. However, he declares it was not murder but mercy that they allowed the man to go away before harming anyone, since they have no cure for the disease. Later, Rose takes Kufa to a church, where she asks him why he agreed to help her. Kufa is dazed out, but then a bunch of kids come running to Rose, and she tells Kufa that these kids lost their parents and her dad adopted them, just like he adopted and raised her. After a while, Kufa returns to the lodging and finds that Melita is mad at him. She commands him to make her wear socks and comments that he doesn't even see her as a girl so she might as well ask him to help her change. Kufa is not having any of her attitude right now and he asks her if she would like to go on a date with him. Melita's behavior immediately changes and she clings to him as they explore the tunnels of the city during their date. They come to a serene location with a glimmering lake and strange rock formations. Melita enjoys the sight and then Kufa leads her along to show her the best part of this limestone cave. He jumps from the cliff along with her and surprisingly, they start flying instead of going down. They twirl and dance in zero gravity as Kufa explains that the zero gravity field was created due to strong magnetic forces in this mystery spot. Melita suddenly gets concerned and asks him why he knows so much about this place, and he replies that he came here for a mission a long time ago. They return to the lodge soon, and Kufa tucks her in as she asks him to take her on a date again someday. She apologizes for being difficult and demanding earlier, claiming that she doesn't want anyone to grow close to him. Melita falls asleep while babbling and Kufa caresses her face, saying that she was the first person to feel like this about him, and that is why he doesn't know what he should do now. Meanwhile, Melita finds herself in a dark place in her dream. She calls out for her teacher, and then hears a voice asking her to give him some blood. Melita wakes up in a cold sweat and wonders what the dream was about and her neck feels weird. Just then, Ela comes running into her room and tells her that someone else has been attacked by the blue flame criminal. Melita is shocked. And then that feeling increases tenfold as she notices that Kufa is not in the room. The girls go to the church where this happened and find Blossom crying over the kids in his orphanage. They had been attacked, and as the principal checks them, she claims their life force has been sucked out just like that of the student who fainted earlier. She asks Melita what her tutor has to say about it, and she replies that Kufa has been missing since the morning. Now Blossom is certain that Kufa is the culprit and he orders his men to find him and bring him here. As the principal leads the girls back, Melita sneaks out to find her teacher, but gets caught by Media instead. She has guessed that Melita wants to find Kufa and take his side, but she feels it is a dumb idea. However, it is also adventurous at the same time and she decides to help Melita. 
They go to her room, where Media starts changing into her battle dress as she tells Melita that they should look out for the mystery spots. Kufran had told her about the growing number of mystery spots in the city over the years and also requested that she look after Melita if anything happened to him. Media puts on a school uniform to stand out less, but then a maid comes there and asks the girls why they are not attending their class. They pretend to be a couple enjoying some girl-on-girl -girl action by bunking the class, and it reminds the maid of her youth, so she hands them chocolate. After that, the girls head out to collect information about mystery spots and Melita's straightforward approach gets her a scolding and a candy. Media says she will show how it is done and leads Melita to a flower shop, where she starts asking the flower lady about the varieties they grow here. She sucks it up to the lady who is a fan of Blossom and talks about his role in identifying the mystery spots. Just like that, Media gets all she wants to know about the mystery spots, and they head to their first destination, the most mysterious of the mystery spots, called the Crook House. They enter the Crook House and feel nothing special, even though Blossom has forbidden anyone from coming near it. Media examines the building and realizes that it was not part of any accident, but built like this from the get-go. She finds a secret door that leads them to an underground staircase. Media warns Melita that anything can happen down there, and tells her to stick close. She keeps on talking about how this place seems to be designed to deter visitors, and that means something sinister was hidden here. They come to an underground dungeon, and after looking at the research labs and empty cages for a while, they see the horrifying sight of dead people chained up in the cages. Media claims that they look like Shangarda citizens, and on top of that, they are the failed products of illegal experimentation with the night gene factor that would turn them into lycanthropes. Melita is horrified, and then Media points out the arm of one of the corpses, who was wearing the same accessory as the man they saw die. She believes that Blossom is the villain of this arc, who was spreading fake news about mystery spots and illnesses so that he could kidnap more people for his experimentation. Suddenly, Melita starts hearing the voice of the Shaggy Man again, asking her to kill people and show him some blood. She gets a mini migraine and then fears that someone else is about to die. She runs outside, wondering how she can know where the accident is going to take place. She goes to the site of the accident, where people are claiming that a student has been killed. She heads inside to find Eli collapsed on the floor and Blossom clinging to the injured Rose, crying that she is dead. Melita is aghast and even the principal has nothing more to tell her about this incident. She claims that Melita did not attend the training session and Eli was worried, so she went to look for her. Naturally, Rose accompanied her student and she was attacked by someone who must have been pretty strong if he could kill her. The man Blossom has chosen as his son-in-law says that it must be Kufa and orders the townsfolk to find him immediately. Blossom gets up, carrying Rose's body, and claims that he can still save her through the power of science. Melita is left speechless and carries Eli back to her room. Baramedia visits her and says that there are not many people in the world who could defeat a paladin like Eli and a seasoned warrior like Rose at the same time. Melita asks her to give her some time alone with her sister, and Media replies that she can take all the time she wants because she is not going to leave her room until the matter outside subsides. As Media leaves, Melita apologizes to Eli, thinking that she was attacked because she came looking for her. Melita wonders what her sister was trying to tell her earlier, and she picks up her sword as she swears to keep her safe. Just then, Melita hears some commotion outside, and Krista comes running in to tell her to escape. She says that this time, Blossom was attacked, and the attacker stole Rose's corpse before running away. The same blue flame mana was found at the scene, and now the entire town is on the hunt for Kufa, with the academy being unable to defend him. The people are looking for Kufa's disciple to use her as a hostage, and Krista barricades the door as she tells Melita to flee. Melita escapes through the window, apologizing to everyone she has caused problems for. She is determined to get to the bottom of things to avenge Eli and Rose and to prove Kufa's innocence. She reaches the boulder where she heard the strange voice from earlier and remembers how fervently both Blossom and Kufa tried to keep her away from it. She is certain it is hiding something and uses her mana to destroy the boulder. A secret tunnel opens up and Melita walks inside, following a small stream for a long time until she is stopped by a human skeleton stuck on a spiderweb. She crawls under the skeleton and resumes her journey, ultimately coming to a secret study in the cave. She finds a document with Blossom's sign and then picks up some random books and scrolls, and thanks to the power of the plot, they tell her everything she needs to know. The books talked only about the research on the night gene factor, its extraction from lycanthropes, and its transplantation in humans. She learns that Blossom had been doing this a long time ago, and seven years ago, he made his biggest mistake during an experiment. Suddenly, Melita hears the voice of the shaggy dude again, and he claims that he can sense someone having crept into his home. He asks Melita who she is, and she draws her sword as she introduces herself as a paladin and asks Shaggy who he is and where he is hiding. 
Shaggy laughs on hearing this and says she will be a valuable test subject, and the scared Melita cautiously looks around the study for any enemies. She suddenly spots Rose, who had come back to life, but her hair color had changed. Melita calls out to her, but that turns out to be a big mistake, as Rose awakens a blue flame in her left eye and approaches Melita, saying that she wants her blood. She acts like an insatiable bloodthirsty vampire as she walks towards Melita, who looks at the blue flame mana and asks Rose if she was the culprit behind everything. Melita hits a table and trips, giving Rose the chance to close the gap. Rose is also following Shaggy's voice, which tells her to feed on the blood of that man's student. Just as Rose attacks Melita, Kufa arrives out of nowhere and saves her. He asks Rose to snap out of it, and Shaggy calls him Ice King, as he greets him with some of the snarkiest insults known to man. Kufa doesn't care, and his true form is revealed as he strains to keep Rose in check. He tells her that she is not a resident of darkness anymore and must use her memories as a human to keep her dark nature in check. His words don't reach through and Rose escapes as Shaggy tells Kufa that she has been thirsty for seven years, and now she will lose herself in her instincts and become his underling. Kufa is disappointed, and on the other hand, Melita is terrified of his bad boy look. He tells her not to come close to him and she asks what will happen if she does. Kufa walks to her and pins her to the ground, saying that now he will use his power to seal her memories of him deep in her heart, never to be disturbed again. He claims that it will not hurt even a bit, but she will see him as a stranger when he is done with the process. Melita protests that she doesn't want that, but Kufa assures her that he will still be her private tutor, even if she forgets him. He claims that no one has ever accepted him in this form, and he is afraid of the look Melita has in her eyes right now. He apologizes to her, saying that sealing her memories is a selfish act from his side. Melita gets up and throws the same lines he once told her, promising to be by his side no matter what the world says. Having learned from the Riz Master himself, she tells Kufa to trust in her as she hugs him tightly, telling him that every part of his body is beautiful. Melita suddenly kisses him, claiming that she really loves him and Kufa is worried because the FBI will still treat him as the guilty one. He tells Melita that they are different, and he is a half lankanthrope and thus her natural enemy. Kufa recites his origin story, which began eight years ago in this town itself. One day, the church orphanage you lived in burned down, courtesy of Blossom and his illegal experiments with the night gene factor. Blossom, who was crying over the deaths of his adopted children, was aided by a giant spider, feasting on humans and forcing him to keep up his experiments, even though he was planning to quit. As the man quarreled with the spider, Kufa, who had died, rose up and his hair turned glowing white. The spider remarked that he did not expect a half-vampire to live so comfortably in the church, but Kufa's main attention was on the injured Rose, who was an orphan like him too. To save her life, he drank her blood and turned her into a vampire, and the spider asked him if he was going to turn the girl into a monster too. Just then, a group of warriors from the White Knight Guild arrived and attacked the spider. However, the spider was much stronger and handed them a big fat L, killing two men and injuring their leader. The spider told the man that he would be his next test subject when suddenly, Kufa attacked its head and gouged both of its eyes. The man took his chance and blew some holes in the spider's belly before using a powerful bullet that took the monster straight to the moon. The man then spotted Kufa hunching over Rose and asked what he was planning. Kufa replied that he was sealing the girl's memories of him so that she would forget about being a vampire and her urge to drink blood would be suppressed. He then turned to the soldier and asked him to at least let Rose go, promising that he would ensure she did not harm anyone. In exchange for her life, Kufa promised to be the soldier's underling and he asked him if he was okay with the girl forgetting him. Kufa shed tears as he claimed that he would be content as long as Rose was happy. She woke up and called him brother one last time and Kufa comforted her as he sealed her memories. Now that he has finished telling his story to Melita, who is comfortably sitting in his lap, he claims that no place in this country is safe for Rose right now and if she is caught, both she and he will be executed. Kufa asks Melita to promise that she will not tell anyone about this to anyone and if she breaks her promise, he will suck all her blood. Melita is flustered because she feels aroused and promises to keep it a secret. Kufa then says that the Lancanthrop spider that attacked the orphanage eight years ago was the culprit behind the recent incidents and was trying to pry open Rose's memories. He cannot believe that the giant spider somehow survived and was yet again working with his old partner, Blossom. Kufa believes that Blossom wants military power and that is why he chose a fiancé for Rose so that he can turn her into a baby-making machine that gives birth to mana users. However, as her true memories and vampire powers are unlocked, Kufa's true form also comes to light, and he must hide so that people do not turn against him. Melita is furious upon hearing this and Kufa tells her that he has a way to solve this problem, but for that, he needs Melita's help. 
He asks if she is willing to risk her life for his plan and Melita replies that he can take her life and her V-card as a bonus. Soon, Rose is completely healed and she is being forced to marry a stranger when she is not in complete control of herself. Just as Blossom is about to officiate the vows, Melita barges into the church and raises objections about the marriage. She calls out to Rose saying that they are both rivals for Kufa's love and she is not going to let her back away now. Rose seems to have lost her memories and trying to remember who Kufa is hurts her little brain. To rile her up more, Melita declares that she has kissed her teacher twice, not caring about the tabloid scandals that will be in every newspaper tomorrow. Hearing these words makes Rose come back to her senses, and she draws her weapons to settle things with Melita. They activate their mana, claiming that their strength will decide who loves Kufa more. Rose attacks first and Melita counters her attack with a flaming strike that misses her opponent but sets Blossom on fire. Fearing the fire, a small spider jumps out of his hair and Melita points her sword at it, claiming that he will die if he doesn't fight back. The spider releases Miss as it transforms into a human and tells Melita that she is done for now. However, she is not phased and tells everyone that he is the Lancanthrope that attacked everyone. The Lancanthrope introduces himself as Nakwa and claims that he underestimated Melita. As everyone tries to confront him, he blows them away and then runs through a hidden door. Rose follows after him and she curses Nakwa as she recalls everything he made her do. She attacked the student in the academy, then the orphans in the church, and even her own student, Eli. However, as Rose tried to drink Ellie's blood, her teacher's instincts overpowered her, and she resisted attacking her even though Nakwa encouraged her. Nakwa did not like her resisting, so he tried to kill her, but she somehow survived. Rose confronts the Spider-Man, asking if he was also the one responsible for the catastrophe during her childhood, and he grabs her neck out of nowhere, claiming that she was much more dangerous now that she had her memories back. He chokes her, and she screams harder, but then begins losing her strength. Just then, Kufa arrives to save the day and kicks Nakwa away, telling him to stay away from his sister. He tells Rose to awaken and the vampire powers hidden inside her activate. Kufa declares that they will kill Nakwa, but he is quite confident and says that he is an Araction, one of the rulers of darkness and will never be defeated by them. He transforms into his real form and Kufa jumps to slash him, but his attack is not strong enough to penetrate it. Rose supports him with her discs and then attacks Nakwa to keep him distracted. Her rapid attacks break a rock and send the debris flying towards the spider, but he uses its web to hold them in place before attacking the two half-vampires. Kufa and Rose dodge its attack and then Rose crawls under its belly and propels it upward using her attacks. The attack sends Nakwa flying right over the mystery spot with zero gravity and he cannot move his body as it is stuck in the air. Unlike him, Kufa skillfully jumps around and uses a fully charged punch to send the spider flying and impales it on a conveniently shaped rock, where conveniently timed lightning Pikachu's the shit out of it. Nakwa has taken the L, but he still survives using his ability to break apart his body into millions of tiny pieces. He escapes through a crack in the ground and Rose fears that he will return one day, but Kufa tells her that it won't happen. As Nakwa enters the church using the tunnel, he is greeted by Melita and other girls who are ready for some pest extermination. The girls attack the tiny spiders and delete them from existence, while Nakwa only cries for them to stop. Outside, Rose hugs Kufa, as she claims to remember everything about him that she had forgotten. He appears gloomy and almost takes out the medicine from his pocket, but then decides against it. Kufa turns to Rose and with a light tap to her bite marks, he immobilizes her. He then tells her that her memories will be sealed away once again, because that is the only way she can remain in society. He uses his power to seal her memories and Rose cries, saying that she does not want that and wants to spend her time with her big brother. Kufa assures her that he will always be near her and look after her. And with that, she loses her memories of him. Meanwhile, Blossom is in his man cave, wailing in front of the woman's corpse, when suddenly Kufa appears behind him. He speculates that this is the corpse of Blossom's wife, and it has already started turning into a lancanthrope now that Nakwa's power is not stopping that process. Kufa guesses that saving her was the reason why Blossom made a deal with the spider, and he starts crying, claiming that he had no choice. Kufa talks of his childhood, when he and his mother were persecuted in this town and seemed fated to die homeless. That time, Blossom took them in and even attended to Kufa's mom on her deathbed. Blossom claims that he was just helping them on a whim, and Kufa takes out the vial from his pocket, stating that it is a medicine that will convert a partial lancanthrope into a normal human. He says that this one is for all the favors Blossom has done him, and then proceeds to pour that medicine into the woman's mouth, reviving her. As Blossom hugs his wife, who is starting to resemble a human once again, Kufa leaves wishing his adoptive dad goodbye. 
After that, the students returned to the academy, gossiping about how Blossom turned himself into the authorities and claimed full responsibility for the recent incidents. Ela is back to her senses, and she wants to know what happened while she was down. Melita refuses to tell her anything and Ela makes the Tickle Monster pay her a visit to find the truth. Meanwhile, Kufa is sitting by himself thinking about what happened and Rose sits opposite him, trying to figure out why she does not remember anything about her time in the town. He asks her if she should not have stayed back in her hometown to help her family, but Rose believes that her mother can handle it well. She then tells Kufa that she has always had a dream since childhood. She wanted to meet someone important who spent a lot of time with her, but she couldn't remember him. So she joined Crest Legion to get famous, so that person would find her instead. As Rose is happy talking about that, Melita comes and takes a seat next to Kufa, telling Rose to stay away from him now that their pretend relationship is over. Rose is not happy with this and Melita rubs salt on her wounds by reminding her that she has already kissed Kufa twice, and he spends the rest of his journey hearing the two girls bicker. Soon the classes resume and the teacher asks students what they know about the seven basic classes and their advantages and disadvantages in front of other classes. Melita tries to be the teacher's pet by reciting the entire Wikipedia page on the topic, while Kufa looks at her from a distance and thinks she has grown a lot recently. However, he knows that there are many people who are not happy that a former failure has been rising to fame so quickly. Soon, the principal announces that before the year ends there will be a final event called the Vidria Goat Exam. Melita and Ile are confused about what is Vibria Goat and Kufa explains that it is the giant labyrinth that lies beneath the central part of their settlement and holds the greatest library of all times that has thousands of years worth of human history. The exam is quite difficult and dangerous, but those who complete it get their library and license and can explore the Vibria Goat library to find forgotten bits of human knowledge. However, only second year students and above can apply for the exam, so this whole bit is useless for Melita and Ile. Just then, the principal arrives there and asks the two girls if they would like to take the exam this year. Kufa says that they are still first-year students, but the principal claims that they were this year's Luna candidates and to prove that their selection was not a mistake, she wants them to prove their worth in the exam. On the other hand, Mew and Sarah present their report from the Luna tournament to their academy and noble faction. Mew claims that the mana Melita carried was vastly different from that of Eli, and it convinces the people there that Melita's mom was indeed mingling with other men. They are certain that Melita is not a legitimate child of the Angel household and the leader of their faction, Sarah's elder brother, suggests that they should declare this news to the entire noble society. Everyone immediately agrees to this proposal, but the pink-haired man wants to find a way in which they can convince the general public about this news. Mew claims that she has a solution for this problem and whips out an ancient book called Anders Codex that was found in Vigria Goat. She claims they can use this book to highlight Melita's dubious origins and Pink Man is pleased with it. He declares that with this document, they will bring down the Angel House and then lead a revolution that will establish them as the leaders of this world. After everyone leaves, Sarah is worried about Melita, but her brother tells her that he is doing this for her good. He claims that many things are looming around Melita right now, and they must take action to put the poor girl out of her misery. Sarah has room temperature IQ, and she thinks that her hypocrite of a brother is telling the truth, so she believes him. Pinkman gives Sarah a special fountain pen that was said to be wielded by a former Vibria Goat librarian and wishes that it will give her some courage. Back at the academy, Melita and Kufa find a commotion as they enter the campus the next day. A very suspicious masked man stands in front of the principal, claiming that he is not suspicious at all and that he is here just to meet his daughter. He looks around and then sees Melita and he immediately rushes to her, calling her his daughter. Melita is taken aback as everyone starts gossiping about her angel family, and the masked man claims that the angel family are demons who stole this woman and his child from him. He approaches her, but Kufa swings his sword to keep him at bay. The masked man turns out to be a circus gymnast and does cartwheels as he gets away from him. He declares that his daughter's boyfriend is too violent and he will never accept him. The masked man throws his hat and then disappears in a flash, leaving Melita distraught. At night, Kufa receives a coded message about Melita being in danger, and he writes a cryptic response asking for help. After that, he visits Melita for her routine body checkup, and he is so lost in thoughts that he ends up copping a feel. Melita asks Kufa if he is worried about what happened in the morning, and he affirms, saying that he always feared someone would spread rumors if they found out about her mana class. He believes that Clownface just wanted to slander the Angel family, and Melita agrees that the man had no relation to her mother. Kufa says that the enemy will have more tricks for her and Melita wants to know if she can do anything. He decides to give her a test of his own and asks her to take the Vibria Goat exam seriously and pass it. 
Melita is flustered because the exam is said to be dangerous and difficult, but Kufa asserts that if she passes it, she will show the public as well as her enemies that she is ready for them. Melita asks him what will happen if she fails the exam and Kufa gets kinky as he tells her that she will get his special punishment in that case. That turns her on and she gets kinky as she asks for a special reward if she passes the test. Kufa promises to fulfill any of her requests if she can pass the exam. Soon, the day of the exam comes and the girls follow the principal to the library gate. Eli is joining Melita, and they are both determined to ace the exam, but Chissa tells them not to push themselves. They stand on the magical elevator and Kufa tells Melita that he will wait for her to come back with good news. The principal activates the elevator, which starts descending gradually and Melita keeps holding her teacher's hand till the last moment as the door closes on them. On the way down, the principal gives the students some basic instructions. She tells them to go to their assigned layers and complete the missions given to them before the time runs out. She explains that the ghosts of the former librarians haunt Vibria Goat, and they get furious if any unauthorized person tries to steal the books. She warns them that the ghosts on the lower layers are more powerful, so they should not venture there. Just then, the elevator comes to an abrupt stop, even though the first layer is still far away. Suddenly, tentacles come out from the walls of the elevator, and I think we all know where this is going. The tentacles break the elevator and attack the girls, and Melita clings to Eli. Outside, Kufa and Rose are on standby when a nun arrives and panics on learning that the principal has left. She exclaims that an important guest has arrived and since the principal is not here, Kufa should be the one to meet him. He is taken aback but then asks about the guest and learns that it was Melita's official dad, Duke Felgus Angel. Kufa immediately goes to greet Felgus and informs him that Melita and Eli have entered the librarian certification exam and they are serious about passing it. Feldis claims that Melita has no need to pass the exam and presents the letter to withdraw her from the academy as he asks Kufa to bring her back immediately. Kufa requests that he stop and asks why he is obstructing her path now, and Felix brings the clown face into the conversation. He claims that putting Melita in public view was always going to bring harm to their family, and now he wants to remedy that. He even tells Kufa that he will be relieved of his job soon. Kufa pleads to let Melita study here for one more year as he can promise some solid results by then, but Feldis is not interested. He states that no matter how much potential Kufa sees in the girl, she doesn't realize her own abilities. However, when Kufa declares that he understands his student the best and requests one final chance, Feldis seems to ponder over it. Just then, another nun comes to the room with a letter bearing a snake seal, claiming that it came to the principal's office. Felgus recognizes that the seal belongs to Guild Grimfis, and he immediately opens the letter, which has a cryptic haiku on its back, hinting that the girls who have gone to the library are in mortal danger. In the library, the tentacles take only Melita and Ely away from the group and bring them to an unknown floor. They are worried about others and about their location too, but Ely notices that the hard glass has started working, which means their test has started. The girls decide to complete their mission without even realizing what floor they are on. Melita recalls that they were supposed to be on the fifth level, which is not so dangerous, but then suddenly, the ghosts of the librarians attack them. Melita and Ely activate their mana and get into a fighting position to face off against the two ghosts. The ghosts keep on attacking them, and the girls are forced only to dodge and block. Soon, Melita begins her counterattack and kicks the ghost into a bookshelf before striking it with her sword. The combat maniac inside her awakens, and she starts having fun. She imitates what Kufa would do in this situation, and thinks that all aspects of his fighting style have permeated her. She keeps on attacking the ghost and finally exercises it. By that time, Eli had dealt with her enemy too, and the girls high five to celebrate their victory. They are filled with confidence that they can still pass the exam even without the principal around, and they decide to move forward. However, Eli notices that their weapons are in bad shape after just one fight, and she jinxes herself by saying that they won't be able to handle more than two ghosts at a time. Suddenly, ghosts appear all around them, and no matter how bad I am at math, I can say that they are more than four. The girls tremble as the ghosts close in on them, but then suddenly, a hurricane surrounds them and deals with all the ghosts at once. Melita wonders what happened, but then she looks up and finds help coming. Miu and Sarah, the backstabbers, are here to pretend to save the girls. Miu claims that they are also here for the library certification exam and suggests that all four of them can take the exam together. Melita says it might not be allowed, but Mia replies that there is no one watching them, so it is good. She manages to convince Sarah and then declares that the four daughters of the three big duke houses are taking their first joint quest. Melita and Ely are also excited about the idea, 
Mew takes out a magic book that acts as a GPS and tells them that they are in the second layer and should take the stairs to reach the fifth layer, where their test will take place. Meliva is surprised to learn about magical texts that work inside the library, but Mew tells her that these books have limited usage. She explains that magical texts are just one of the many ways to keep intruders confused in the library. She hands a book to Melita, who finds that it is written in a strange language and Mew explains that without the librarian license, they cannot read it. Sarah praises Mew, saying that she comes from a family of researchers and librarians and Eli remarks that it is unfair for her to know everything about this place even though it is her first time. Mew feels pressure by her gaze and changes the topic, claiming that they can utilize the magical text by using the magical keyword, once upon a time. She urges Melita to try it out, and as she says the keyword, a mist surrounds her, and she changes into a Cinderella-like dress. The magic worked on everyone, and Mew explains that they have been blessed with the power of fairy tales. She explains that Melita is Cinderella, so she has divine protection. Eli is the little red riding hood, and she has the wildness of a big bad wolf. Mew claims her own power is that of Aladdin, and she can use the genie's magic a total of three times. However, Sarah drew the short stick and got transformed into the Little Mermaid, and she looks much better than the live-action movie. The three girls are jealous that she's the only one who has some decent curves, so they have some fun with her till the magic of the book runs out. Eli reminds them that they have to hurry before the exam's duration is over, and the girls head to the exam room. They find a task-granting book in the center of the room that asks them if they are willing to take the exam. On affirmation, it gives the girls the task of mending and orderly arranging the books in the room. The pile of books is quite huge, but that is not the only challenge they face. A book-eating magical imp comes out of the pile, and they have to defeat it to mend the books. Melita takes up the task and slashes the imp immediately, mending the book. However, it is too early to celebrate as the imps are hidden in every other book. They come out all at once and Melita asks her friends to arrange the books while she deals with them. The three who chose the easier job also struggle as the books refuse to go onto the shelves. Eli manages to place her book and Mew looks in it for clues and finds that it is like solving a puzzle. Mew asks Melita to buy her time while she solves the puzzle. As Melita hunts down the imps and the other girls try to arrange the books, Mew decodes the puzzle. She commands Eli and Sarah to arrange the books while Melita is still dealing with the imps. Soon, the last book is also mended and Sarah provides a boost to Melita so she can jump up and place the book in its spot. Mew tosses the book towards her, and Eli keeps the imps from reaching it. With that, Melita places the book and the remaining imps implode. Melita falls, but Sarah uses her Namor-like powers to save her, and the girls celebrate their victory. Suddenly, four books start glowing and turn into proof that the girls have passed their exam, and all that's left is to return to the outside world in time. Mew then asks Melita and Eli why they are so eager to pass the exam, and she thinks for a while before answering that she wants to be acknowledged as the child of the Angel family and pass the test given by her teacher. Mew tells Melita that even if she passes the exam, it doesn't actually prove that she is the child of the Angel family. Melita is taken aback, but Ela comes ahead to defend her and Mew apologizes for saying unnecessary stuff. After that, she asks the group to follow them outside, but Sarah steals Melita's book and refuses to give it back. Mew presses her against the wall and asks her to return the book, but Sarah declares that this exam is a trap. On the other hand, the senior girls have also finished their exams and reunited with the principal. She tells them that the tentacles that destroyed the elevator were created from an ancient magical text, and she promises to hold an investigation after they reach the academy. Krista is worried about the first years, but the principal claims they must reach the academy and call backup to search for them. Just then, two hooded figures arrive, and they claim that no one will escape this place alive. The principal guesses that they are the culprits behind the incident, and together with Krista, she takes them on. However, the two men are nothing but zombie puppets, and their controller shows himself after they have been defeated. The old wizard-like man greets the principal and introduces himself as an apostle of the guild Grimfis, an artificial lancanthrope, and a necromancer. The principal asks him why he is targeting her students, and he replies that dead men tell no tales. He summons more of his minions who attack the girls, and as the principal tries to save them, she gets stabbed in the back. She is on her knees and swears to protect her students, even at the cost of her life. The necromancer fulfills her wishes and commands his minions to attack them, but Kufa arrives at the last moment and saves the day. He slashes through all the zombies, and as the necromancer calls more of them, they also meet the same brutal end. Kufa then makes mincemeat of the necromancer and the rest of the zombies lose their powers. The principal collapses at the same time and two girls apologize to her, because they read the magical text that brought forth the tentacles. They claim that their parents ordered them to do it, but they never knew it would turn out like this. 
However, the danger is still not over, and the necromancer evolves into the undead Jiga Chin after dying. He commands his servants to come to his aid, and Kufa gets ready for action again. He supports the principal as everyone runs to the elevator. But the Jiga Chin appears there and summons the ghosts of the library to attack them. Kufa charges at them, but finds that he cannot deal with the ghosts in his human form. He wants to use his vampire power, but his heart wavers because he does not want to reveal this secret, as that would separate him from Melita. However, help arrives just in time as Kufa and the students are protected by a cage made of bandages. The mummy, who has now become Kufa's underling, comes to help him and strangles Jiga Chin to stop its supernatural powers. The undead curses him, but the mummy crushes its bones with his power and turns them to dust. After that, Kufa thanks the mummy, who says that he needs him alive so that they can see through their plan. The girls are afraid of him because they can sense he is a lankanthrope, but Krista thanks him for saving their lives. The mummy blushes at the first comment he has received in his entire life and then proceeds to tell Kufa that the danger has not subsided yet. The letter sent to the office was only so that Kufa would go to the library and leave the academy unguarded. Gil Grimfist plans to launch a wide-scale attack on the academy and kill all the students there who witness the clown mask claiming to be Melita's dad. Kufa thinks that they won't succeed because he has left his B-team there who have already dealt with the attackers. Just then, Kufa's boss arrives and he turns to the mummy and asks if he wants to join their guild. He refuses his offer and says that he is only interested in sharing information. In exchange for learning the method to convert a lancanthrope into a human, he promises the boss to act as a spy and report criminal activity to him. He accepts this deal and then turns to Kufa, telling him that he has received information about unauthorized entry into the library and one of the three major families, the Shiksel family, is behind it. He tasks Kufa to investigate things and he runs to find Melita, fearing that she might be in danger. On the lower floors, Melita asks Sarah what she meant by the exam being a trap, and Emai reads the book to find that they passed the grade 5 exam instead of grade 6. They realize that Miu and Sarah tricked them and ask why they did so. However, as the ghosts of the library fly away, Mew takes the chance and steals Melita's book from Sarah. She smirks as she reads that Melita's class is not paladin but samurai. She runs away saying that this information must be passed to Pink Man and Sarah offers to help Melita follow her with her flight magic. Melita finally corners Mew and pins her to the ground and asks her why she tricked her when they were supposed to be friends. Mew caresses her and replies that she did it because she likes her. She suddenly uses the keyword and activates the power of all the magical texts lying near them. As the pages surround them, Sarah tells Melita to get away, but it is too late, and a bright purple light engulfs them. Melita sees a dream as she is blinded by the lights. In the dream, she recalls the people who refused to be her instructors because they felt she was incompetent, and how Kufa was the first one to accept the role. Suddenly, her dream ends and she finds herself in a strange, misty place wearing a maid outfit. Mew welcomes her to the illusory courtroom and tells her to behave herself as the main show is about to start. The mist dissipates and Melita suddenly finds herself in a mock courtroom, with masked guests and with Pinkman as the judge. The trial begins and Melita still is still not understood what is going on. Mew explains that Pinkman is the judge as well as the conspirator for this incident and under his command she led Melita and others into this trap. Melita understands now and refuses to entertain their drama because she has to pass her library and license test. However, Pink Man tells her she cannot leave, calling her the fake daughter of the Angel family. He commands me to start recording and she activates Amber's Codex, telling Melita to be mindful of her words because everything will be recorded in this book from now on. Pink Man starts the session, declaring that Melita's crime is that she is not the real daughter of the Angel family and has been deceiving the country for 13 years. He claims that a man who claims to be her real father has appeared and since her class is samurai, it is easy to prove that her lineage is doubtful. Melita counters his point saying that in some cases, people don't inherit the high-ranking classes even after being born into noble families. However, Pinkman corners her by asking why she suddenly manifested her mana when she was 13 years old. Melita hesitates while giving an answer, and the crowd goes crazy, keeping her guilty. They say that Melita's mother cheated on Felgus just because he was too busy with his job and could not give her any attention. They insult her some more and Melita cannot control her rage any longer. She screams at everyone to stop and claims that she clearly remembers how much her mom loved her and her dad. She silences the haters, saying that she will join the Crest Legion and prove her worth as a daughter of the Angel family. Pinkman says that he will have her prove her worth right now and commands Sarah to attack Melita. Sarah is completely under his control and attacks Melita, despite her asking her to stop. Melita dodges her attack and Ela passes her sword to her. 
As Melita and Sarah face each other, Mew stops Eli from making a move. Sarah tells Melita to stop resisting and promises to end her peacefully, but she replies that her samurai class should not be underestimated. She presses Sarah, who uses her flight ability and takes the high ground before raining spears on Melita. Melita keeps on dodging the attack as Mew comments that she has no chance to win against Sarah's Dragoon class. If she gets a crushing defeat from a daughter of a noble family who is the same age as her, it will be proved that she is unworthy of her family name. Eli recalls what Melita told her about Mew being pretty and kind and she hates her guts for being a pathetic liar now. She decides to face her and protect Melita from fake friends like her. Meanwhile, Melita has to keep dodging Sarah's spear reign even as she tries to reach her level. Everyone thinks that Sarah is dominating, but Pinkman thinks the opposite and wonders how Melita can be so strong. Suddenly, she trips and Sarah rushes in, seeing a chance to finish her, but she gets trolled as Melita moves out of her way at the last moment to crush her heel wings. Everyone is stunned that Sarah lost and Melita lets the Hatters hear that she takes pride in being a samurai. She says that she has someone she looks up to, and together with him, she will prove her worth. The people now start believing that Melita is really the Duke's daughter, and they committed treason by capturing her. Seeing public opinion change, Pinkman resorts to his final card to erase all evidence against him and activates the fountain pen he gifted his sister. The pen falls out of Sarah's pocket and a single drop of ink drops on the ground, turning into a huge black hole. The ink turns into a giant dragon and shoots a fireball at Melita. However, Sarah is back to being herself and she saves her life. Mia remarks that this is the power of an alternate fountain pen that can rewrite the effects of magical texts. The black hole keeps on growing and swallows some of the guests while the others run away. Melita cannot take it while sitting down and she plans to finish the ink dragon despite Sarah stopping her. Miu and Ely also come to them and decide to combine their powers and stop this madness. They first let the crowd escape and the old lady who comes last in the survival race turns out to be Ellie's headmaid. Melita is not exactly shocked to see her and she decides to let her go along with the other conspirators. However, as it is time for the girls to leave, the door closes and the clown face appears in the center of the garden. He uses his power to transform this realm into a cage, and then tells the girls that it is time for the finale event. Ela curses the masked fiend and charges at him to avenge her sister, but he splashes some black stuff at her sword that starts eroding it. The masquerade kicks Ely away and Melita saves her, but he plans to finish her now. He sends the black stuff towards Melita, but then Kufa arrives at the last moment and slashes the attack, turning the ink into water. Melita is relieved to see him and Kufa promises that he will definitely keep her safe now. However, Melita no longer wants to watch from the shadows and decides to join him in the fight. They rush towards the masquerade and as Kufa stalls him, Melita appears behind him for a sneak attack. He dodges the attack, but Melita and Kufa use their perfect teamwork to keep him pinned. Kufa kicks him into the air and then Melita hits him with the hilt of her sword to give him some more elevation as she remembers her training with Kufa. Finally, Kufa uses his ultimate move called Thousand Blade and surrounds the masquerade with phantom blades that destroy him and his cage instantly. Melita is glad about the victory and immediately runs to hug her teacher, while the other girls tell them to get a room. Soon, everyone returns to the real world and their lives return to normal. Pinkman hides his involvement in the recent kidnapping and attack on Melita by pinning all the blame on the masquerade, whom he actually killed. The man was a former member of the Crest Legion, and as the search to find him continues, Felbis takes charge of the Academy's security. Soon the day comes for him to return to his estate and Melita runs to him, gathering the courage to talk to him. Felbis walks up to her and tells her that during his grandmother's era, one of her relatives had the same samurai class as her, so she does not need to worry. Then he compliments her golden hair and claims she resembles her mother, which drives Melita to tears. As she starts bawling her eyes out, Feldus realizes it is time for him to leave on the milk run and he entrusts his daughter to Kufa. The drain departs and Kufa comforts his crying student, saying that her life will get better from now on. Soon after that, Melita and Kufa meet in the garden where he first saved her, and she claims to have decided on her reward for passing the library exam. She asks Kufa to support her till she becomes someone whom society acknowledges, and after that moment comes, she promises to risk her life to protect him instead. Kufa is moved by her determination and kisses her hand, promising to always stay by her side. 